How are you, Scott? Good. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. All right. Great. Well, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Looks like we have a number of people uh, dialing in here, and we're at the top of the hour. So maybe we should go ahead and uh, and kick this off if you're ready. Sounds good. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Scott Oath with Cahill Financial Advisors and joined with a uh, special guest here, Andrew Rice from Thornburg Investment Management. And uh, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Uh, a couple fronts, Thornburg is a unique investment manager and we'll hear a little bit about that and their approach and their strategies and, uh, and, and really spend some time on some research that they've done and methodologies they've developed to solve one of the, the main problems or the, the top questions, reasons people hire me, people come to us is how do we create a sustainable income stream in retirement? And I think I'd mentioned the invite that I sent out to a lot of you folks. I've studied this problem for decades. It's been a central part of my career, uh, both working with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, certainly. And uh, I taught the retirement course in the Certified Financial Planner Program to other professionals and also as in institutional training. And there's been lots of academic research and studies on this. There's different methodologies. There's some common rules of thumb that get a lot of attention that I actually think uh, uh, get a bit too much attention, maybe a bit too simplistic or somewhat flawed. Uh, there's some more complicated methods. There's product-based methods, which I, you know, I fear have extra expenses and complications in them. So it, it, it's, uh, it's something we look at a lot, both in terms of what, what works, what has worked in the past, what are the threats and risks in the future, and how do we solve this? So we'll, we'll be spending, um, spending the probably the bulk of the conversation on Thornburg's approach to developing an endowment style spending policy for individual retirees. So, but up front, uh, as you know, if you've joined us before, I, I need to throw in some uh, important disclosures uh, to keep our compliance department and the SEC happy. So first of all, uh, everything we talk about here is, you know, conversational, it's uh, educational, but nothing should be interpreted as specific advice for anyone listening, you know, seek your own expert opinion, do your own research, by all means, you know, give me a call at the office and we can talk this through how this how this applies to you. Uh, it's important for us to note that um, uh, while I have uh, friends in admiration for Thornburg Investment Management, we are completely separate entities. There's no financial relationship between the two of us. Each of our uh, opinions and approaches are, are our own. We're not making representations for each other. So, um, that's uh, to, to, to throw that part out. And I uh, just want to also um, say thank you to the, the team behind the scenes at Thornburg who helped make this happen and committing time and resources, both in the research and uh, getting Andrew together with us to make this happen. And also on, on my side uh, with my team internally, uh, coordinating this, setting up the time, the technology, um, Anna, Kevin, Derek, Diane Park, one of my great partners. I know she has a, a few clients joining us for this. So uh, thank you all. And you know, with that, uh, Andrew is, your title is Advisor Solutions Director. So with Thornburg Investment, I know you've, you've had a long career in the investment industry and you've been with Thornburg for quite a while. And now really this type of engagement is at the heart of your role, isn't it? Sharing the information about the company and your research and your approach. So you are the perfect person within the company to have on this call, which is great. And uh, Andrew has a degree in finance from Texas A&M, is that right? Yep. And certified That's investment correct. management analyst. So certainly well qualified in addition to his uh his, uh, his track record and, and boots on the ground experience. So, you know, with that, Andrew, maybe just to kick it off, could you tell us a bit about your company? Because uh, you're, you're in a unique location, you have a unique history, and I think that that kind of helps frame part of the story. You know, what, uh, tell us what we need to know about Thornburg. Yeah, Scott, no, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be a part of this. I wanted to echo just real quickly as we get started, the, uh, the appreciation for your internal team. Um, I do a number of these, and, and you guys have made this extremely, uh, a very smooth process. So, so thank you again to them. Um, you know, as far as Thornburg goes, as, as Scott, as you mentioned, I, I've been at Thornburg for about 15 years. 
Uh, we are a privately held company uh, based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, that, that is obviously not the, the epicenter of the financial universe. And we like it that way. Um, you know, we are a, a, a privately held company. Um, our portfolio managers and other senior members at the firm own, own the company. And, and I, think that is, I think that is unique. I think it is very important. I'm obviously biased. Um, but, but the portfolio managers have a vested interest, Scott, on a day-to-day -day basis about you and about your clients. And I, I think that is, not that other asset managers don't, but being privately held makes, makes us unique in, in that regard. And so we are away from the noise of Wall Street. One of the things we've, we've really worked to do is that, that we, we want to partner with, with, with you, the advisors, and the end client from an education standpoint. The educated client is the, is the best client, and that, that's, our, that's our objective. Yes, we manage mutual funds. We do domestic stocks. We do foreign stocks. We do bonds. You name it. But so do a lot of other people. Um, and, and we want to help from an education standpoint. This particular topic, um, the, the road of retirement and some of the specifics we'll be talking about, I've been researching and presenting around really for the better part of 15 years. It is, it is something that personally I am very passionate about. Um, as my parents retired a number of years ago, I helped walk them through this. And, and the best thing about this, Scott, uh, as far as the material goes, in my opinion, it doesn't tell you there's a right way or a wrong way to handle retirement, to handle withdrawing money out of your retirement portfolio, um, it does tell you that it's important to have a plan. And, mm -hmm. and that, uh, I, I've told more people, um, it's got a little bit of a sidebar, that, that uh, I actually had breakfast with my financial advisor last week. And somebody would say, well, why, why do you have a financial advisor? You're, you're in finance, you're, you're with an asset manager. Yeah, but there's a whole holistic component to this that is, that is really important that I want to make sure when I get to that phase in my life, I'm prepared for. So um, it is something that, um, that, that we, are, we are very passionate about for certain. Yeah, I would, I would echo, uh, uh, again, a few of the things that you said. First of all, that, you know, the independence and the private ownership. Well, I, I know many, many people in the industry on, on various different platforms and lots of very smart, ethical, hardworking folks. Uh, I, I do really like the independent private ownership model in this industry. I've, I've worked for big banks, big insurance companies, big brokerages in the past. You know, for the last 20 or so years, I've been on this type of uh, format. And you know, currently, my partners and I, we each own our practice. There's no managers above us pushing for sales results. There's no outside shareholders wanting to see quarterly results. And it just allows you to take really the long view, which you know is so key in this business to doing the right thing um, and in not uh, having external pressure to, to sway you into some type of approach or short-term decision-making. So I think both in our seat as a direct financial advisor, that's that's very, very important. And obviously with the, uh, the asset manager, you know, some of the major, um, th there is a difference between flying into LaGuardia and flying into Santa Fe, I've noticed from the last time I was out there. The, the airport's a little bit different, but I think also, you know, when, when you're a private equity backed company or you're publicly traded company, uh, you just see the the flow of new products being rolled out that are probably designed to um, capture assets primarily when really they can stick with more of a tried and true type type process. So I think uh, that is key. And, you know, also maybe a thought on your comment about meeting with your own financial advisor and, and congratulations. I, I think that's very admirable. You know, I, I personally have my own team of tax and, and legal experts and insurance people I turn to. And, and it's, uh, we have and have had clients who are CPAs work with a lot of executives who have prestigious MBAs. You know, people who are smart enough they can figure out the analytical part of this themselves. We have a hedge fund analyst, a fellow who's a private wealth manager for one of the most you know exclusive cache type entities out there. But there's also very much the human, the psychological side. Aside from the nuts and bolts, you know, maybe you don't want to spend time thinking about this because sure you know it, you could do it, and there's that part of it but also just having someone as a sounding board who's one step removed um, from your own money, I think can be incredibly valuable when times get get tight. And that's a big part of what we're talking about here with the, uh, the retirement spending policy is, hey, when you're accumulating, when you're building on the way up, buy low, sell high, buy the dips, ride it out, that all makes sense and that can work, you know, if you if you keep a lot of determination, but the game really does change when it becomes time to start figure out how do we live off of this portfolio? 
how do we maintain our spending power and and build it inflation's been a big topic over the last year but not something that got a whole lot of attention you know we would bring it up and people kind of nod their head but it wasn't as front of mind as it is now so you know staying ahead of inflation so your cost of living even at a modest inflation level say four percent could double in 20 years easily in in uh in retirement so how do you manage that but you know Often when I'm meeting with someone who's on the on the verge of retirement or planning for it, you know, one of the things we talk about is you should very likely expect, expect that you'll go through three to five bad bear markets over the course of your retirement. So how do we design a game plan to insulate ourselves from those market shocks and make sure the checks keep coming in the mail? Um but still have enough growth on the upside. And, and uh, you know, maybe just kind of a few quick thoughts to, to tee it up. You know, traditionally there is the approach, I think maybe in a lot of our, uh, the silent generation, the greatest generation, Eisenhower type era, you know, live off the interest and live off the dividends purely. And that was an approach that was viewed very sacred. You know, don't touch principle, have your nest egg and just live off principle. And, and a lot of those folks had government and company pensions, and maybe the assets that they had on the side were smaller. And that don't touch the principal part made sense when interest rates were high. But as interest rates fell and we're in this very, very low interest rate period, it became very tough to live, you know, just off interest on a, a 2% yield or something like that. And then we went in a period where we had a wonderful bull market in stocks and stocks were high. And the thought was, well, we're averaging a 10% annualized return. Hey, you can take out seven, eight percent, and you'll be fine. Uh, Peter Lynch was this rock star portfolio manager for Fidelity in the '80s. He was on the cover of all the investment magazines and had an incredible track record. And he sort of blundered. He wrote an article for Worth magazine in the mid uh, uh, mid '80s, saying, "You know, you average ten percent, you can take seven percent a year out of your portfolio." And uh, some readers, a sharp reader, wrote in and said, "Hey, that's that doesn't work." because investments don't grow in a straight line. And we're suffering from this recency bias of upward markets, bull market of the 80s. You know, if you take 7% out during down years, that can eat up your portfolio very quickly. And so just to kind of tee it up before I, you, then we had some some studies, uh, Trinity University in the 80s, and a fellow named Bill Bengen, where they, they took a different look at this approach and said, how do we come up with a, a methodology of determining a safe withdrawal rate that we can spend off a portfolio through up and down years. And <clears throat> what came out of that, I just wanna mention is what's widely called the, you know, the 4% withdrawal rule. And you see this all over the place, okay? And there's been lots of different versions of this, lots of back testing, lots of looking at that. But the idea of look at your initial portfolio value at your retirement starting date, and you can take 4% per year and adjust that upward for inflation each year. There's been lots of different looks at, uh, look at valuations, putting guardrails on that. Even you know, one of the, uh, the original folks, Bill Bengen, who did a lot of research on this said, well, it's probably more like four and a half percent. but I think it's an interesting back of the envelope quick sketch on this because if you say, well, I have $1 million or $2 million or $5 million, how much could I spend in retirement? It gives you, I think, a decent starting point, but there's so many flaws in this methodology. Um, big one is just that you're you're pegging your entire retirement off of what that portfolio was at the starting date. So, you know, Andrew, if I had someone walk in the door a year ago and they were invested all in S&P 500, uh, you know, I might have told them, okay, 4% of that number, that's your retirement spending. We're going to adjust that for inflation. And we had a, a terrible down year in the S&P 500 and we had very high inflation, but they would still be riding that out and building up their retirement income off that versus if someone walked in my door yesterday, well, their portfolio would be 20% lower than it was a year ago because of the, the bear market. And uh, why would I tell them that their retirement number would be, you know, 20% less going forward. It just makes no sense. Or you extend that out. If someone walks in my door because they met someone at the golf club and said, oh, I've been working with Scott and I like the way he works and you should talk to him. Let's say they're 75. If they come in, I'm not going to ask them what their portfolio value was when they were 65. It's completely irrelevant. We want to know where they're at now, right? So today is the first day of the rest of your life. We want to look at that current value and use that to project forward. So with that, why don't you tell us about what, what you guys have done and, and your uh, maybe better methodology and way of, of looking at that? 
Yeah, no, great, great, uh, great lead in, Scott. I appreciate that. And I, I think you, you made a comment that, that I think is very important. You mentioned that everybody in the, in the course of their lifetime and, and retirement will experience three to four bear markets. I think what's also important about, about that is the timing of them, right? And, and to, to your point, if somebody retired 18 months ago, their experience going forward, they're going to get the same average annual return as, as, as their friends, as their neighbors, but their experience versus somebody that retires right now considerably different. You know, I, I, I think back and then we'll dive into this. I started a 529 for one of my kids in 06 and I started a 529 for one of my kids in 09. Mm -hmm. They have the same amount of money in them right now. Mm -hmm. I've contributed significantly more to the 06 because we did it right into the financial crisis. Right. So timing is a, is a big part of it, of it as well. So Scott, do you mind if I share my screen just real Absolutely. quickly as we get into this? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, can you see the uh, the slide here? Yes. Okay. Okay, so just real quickly as we get into this, Scott, I, I wanted to mention, so this is out of the Road of Retirement Toolkit. Each one of these are kind of the topics. We're going to focus in on the endowment spending policy, um, as well as the dividends and the, the, the ability for dividend growth. Scott, you alluded to inflation. Uh, if there's one consensus on the street, it's that inflation is here and, and will continue. So that, that's going to be important around dividends. One thing I wanted to remind the audience is that each one of these sections, we have additional white papers. If folks want more detail around them, Scott, you and your, your team there uh, have, have, uh, have access to these and can, can send these out. Um, so is it clicking through, Scott? Am I on, on the lifestyle spending policy? Yep, absolutely. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to hit this just real quickly. Scott, you mentioned this. This is the lifestyle spending policy is the approach that, that the industry uses. It is you retire with a million dollars or whatever that dollar amount is. You decide you want to spend 4%, 5%, 6%, whatever that number is, and you spend it. And then you go to the next year and you simply adjust for the cost of living, your lifestyle adjustment. It has nothing to do with what the portfolio value is worth. It simply has to do with what you spent the previous year. So to stress test this a little bit, which I think to, to your point about threats and risks in the future, Scott, we stress test this in two of the worst times to retire in the past 100 years. Those two times were 1973 and 2000 for completely different reasons. If you retired in 1973, you had a portfolio that was 60% stocks and 40% bonds. You had pretty, pretty good returns. The, the, the average annual return going forward from there was, was low double digits. And so that was an appropriate return. The challenge in 1973 was inflation. Inflation was running at double digits. So it was running roughly 11% for the next decade. So your real return on your investments was zero. If you look at 2000, from 2000 to 2010, inflation was not an issue. It ran between two and a half and three and a half, kind of a normalized inflation number. But as we, we all refer to the 2000 decade, it was the lost decade. You got no return from your stocks, no return from your bonds. So these are the two extremes. One, great returns, high inflation. One, normal inflation, but very, very muted to, to, to no returns. The likelihood is going forward, whenever you retire, or if you've retired, you're gonna fall somewhere in the middle of that. But we wanted to stress test it just so we could see, see the extremes. So what this shows here, Scott, is we have somebody that retired with a million dollars. They were gonna take 6%. Uh, and what we found, you, you mentioned Bill Bingen, and, and there's a lot of studies around 4%. 4% sounds great until you sit down with somebody, Scott, and say, here's what 4% is for you. And they say, <laughs> no, 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 I, I need a little bit more. So, yeah. so we used the six, we used 6%. Um, so the dark blue line is the 1973 retiree. We're, we have a million dollars. We're properly allocated 60-40. We take $60,000. We adjust for inflation. The challenge, as we discussed, is inflation was running at a double digit clip. So 15 years into retirement, you're taking $160,000 out of what used to be a million dollar portfolio. Mm -hmm. Completely unsustainable. Not only unsustainable for, for you to keep living off of, but there's no chance for you to leave the money to, to a passion that you have, whether that's a, a charity or an heir or whatever that is. It, 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 it dissolves all of that. The 2000 retiree, we go up by inflation, which is the same situation, 
Um, but, but inflation is muted. It's two and a half to 3%. The problem is our portfolio is not doing anything. So right. from a erosion into the portfolio, we're still, we're still eroding. We're, we're still, still chewing into that portfolio. So here's the output of that. Just looking at the results of what a lifestyle spending policy could get you if you do the, the traditional four five or 6%. So if we do 6% in 1973, we have a combination 60, 40 portfolio. Again, I, I think what's important about this, Scott, is we're properly allocated. We're not talking about somebody that bought a bunch of technology stocks or emerging stocks. Yeah, not an this investment blunder. Yeah, right. It, ex exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's 60% S&P 500, 40% intermediate term government bonds. Mm -hmm. If we do 6% and do a lifestyle spending, close to 15 years into retirement, we're out of money. But we have the conversation and say, okay, we can take less than 6%. We'll do, we'll do 5%. Well, it gets us a little bit further down the road, but still 21 years into retirement, we're out of money. Now, if you're able to dial it back to the 4%, you can see that it, it does get you there. You're just not getting much in between on, on a 4% basis. So this, this is the result of the, uh, of the lifestyle spending and what is, is, is traditionally used in, in our industry. But to your point, Scott, what we propose is thinking about it the way that endowments think about their spending. When it comes to spending, endowments are no different than retirees. They take 4%, they take 5%, they take 6% out of their nest egg and spend it on an annual basis, same as retirees. The difference as we go through this, you'll see, is that they consider what the portfolio is doing over time versus just what they spent the previous year. Not not a hundred percent. It's a simple tie-in. So let me let me run through this so everybody can kind of see it in practice. So the concept: we have a long-term spending policy that combines a spending rate with an annual smoothing rule that adjusts spending amount to gradually reflect the changes in portfolio market value. Again, we're not adjusting whole hog, if you will. We're just making a simple tweak. An example we're going to look at on the next slide is going to be a five percent spending rate a 90-10 smoothing rule. So 90% of our spending going forward is based off of what we spent. If we were doing the lifestyle spending policy, that would be 100 to zero. 10% of it is based off the current portfolio value. So the, the, the benefit, the strength, we gradually adjust the spending levels to reflect underlying portfolio performance. It requires a little bit of belt tightening and down markets. The spending changes have a smoothing effect. The challenges, it's more complicated. The easier way to do it, Scott, you get to January, get to February, you look at what CPI did the previous year, we spent 50,000, we're gonna adjust. Yeah. It takes a little bit more work. You, you know, um, and maybe being a, a, a bit cynical, Andrew, but I, I think it's deserved. Uh, I think part of the popularity of the 4% rule, both in terms of individuals and many professionals in the industry is, is its simplicity and they don't necessarily want to do the hard work. It gives a very easy, you know, you can come up with it like that um, in terms of what the, the amount is. And I think it's, uh, I think it's very worthwhile to put a bit more thought and analysis into it. You, you know, this, this idea of taking a look at the current value and your smoothing rule and, and the, the formulas. Very interesting. Sometimes I think about, um, I mean, some of the people who are listening might know, you know, I have a passion for the outdoors and I actually have a hobby where I guide wilderness trips. And if I'm putting together a uh, wilderness canoe trip or a backpacking trip, or, you know, like this time of year, a, a toboggan sled winter camping trip, I develop a plan, a time and travel plan. Okay, we're going here, we're going to this point. I have the map, I mark out the coordinates. We have a uh, a, an agenda, you, you might call it, but I'm regularly as the guide, as the trip leader, checking in on that because there's all types of factors that might make us move slower. You know, weather, temperature, elevation. Someone's having a, a physical or a health issue. The, the trail condition might be poor. I, I don't know. There's there's all different types of things. So we're constantly sort of recalibrating. I'm looking at the map. Where are we now? And what's a reasonable plan? And do we need to fall back to plan B or plan C or, you know, go to one of our bailout points because the original plan is just not sustainable. And so, uh, you know, planning upfront is, is critical, but 
what I like about your approach here is taking a look at where you actually are and updating it that way. No, and I think that's a great analogy, Scott, because it obviously leads to, to the, there's, a, there's a better chance of success in, in your trip if, if you take a step back and maybe audible a little bit and take a day off or what have you. So that's, that's all this is trying to do. Again, it's not telling you that there's a right way or a wrong way or a best way to invest in stocks. It's just telling you to evaluate where you are and, and, and do we need to, to audible. So the, the, the challenge is from a weakness standpoint, again, it's more complicated, still easy to implement. It does require belt tightening during down markets. And so, so that, that is the reality. Here is the, here's the formula behind it. And, and, and there's a lot here. So just, Scott, I want to remind anybody listening right now, we do have a white paper that digs into this a little bit deeper. Um, and, and so I don't want anybody to walk away from this and say, I don't, I don't understand that, or I'd like to read more. So sure. this, this shows if we use the endowment spending policy in 1973, so we're going to use real world results here. So we retired with a million dollars. We're going to spend 50,000, 5%. Um, and, and so in year one, that's a 50,000 spend. We go to 1974, our portfolio value is down to 869,000. God, I'm going to be a little bit biased here, but obviously they didn't own enough Thornburg in the portfolio, <laughs> right? So, so, they're, so they're, they're, they're down a little bit. Um, we're still going to spend 52,409. So we're not asking anybody to spend less. That's a spending rate of 6%. So how did we get to that number? And, and why is the endowment spending policy doing its job? You can see below the, 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 the dark blue line or the thick blue line in 1974, 90% of our prior year spending, so 90% of 50,000 is 45,000. Then we look at the portfolio value. We take 10% of our portfolio value. We multiply that by the 5%, which is our spending rate. And that's the 4349. So we add those two together, it gives us a subtotal before our cost of living adjustment of 49,349. We are gonna adjust it for cost of living. As I mentioned previously, 73, the issue was not necessarily longer term performance in your portfolio, it was inflation. So our cost of living adjustment was 6.2% in 1974. That gives us an adjustment of $3,060, a spending amount of 52,409. So we increased our spending, even in a down market, 4.8%. The difference, Scott, and that this is where this is advantageous to, to the retiree, had we just done the lifestyle spending, we would have gone up 6.2%. So, so we just simply tightened our belt a little bit. We looked at the way that endowments think about spending. We're still spending the 52409 but we're not spending an increase of 6.2%. We go to the next bar, 1975. Portfolio's down again, down to around 700,000. We're gonna spend 56,239, which is a spending rate of 8%. It's uncomfortable. We're, we're in a period that is uncomfortable, but we're addressing it by identifying what our portfolio value is, is doing. So we take 90% of prior years uh, spending, which is 47,168, 10% of our portfolio value. Multiply that by our 5%, which is 3,498. Add those together, gives us $50,666. At this point, we do a cost of living adjustment, 11%. This again is what we're talking about during this time period. So we still do that adjustment. Mm -hmm. That's 5,573. We add that together, gives us the 56. 239, which is an increase of 7.3%. Again, Scott, as we discussed, the difference is had we just done a lifestyle spending adjustment, we would have gone up 11%. Mm -hmm. So the portfolio is, is more sustainable. You know, sorry to interrupt, maybe one of yep. the interesting things Please I've do. noticed is uh, you've got some very good uh, math here. You know, this methodology is a lot of work done in this by major institutions. When we're talking about endowments. You're talking about large, you know, universities and and uh, you know, charitable organizations have large pools of assets like this over a long time periods. So there's a lot of back testing to this. I I've noticed, you know, talking to retirees in real life during down markets, 
there is a natural sense that if you're like, well, we feel like we should cut back. And some of the straight line type methodologies or like you're talking about the lifestyle type spending versus no, no, you, you know, even though the portfolio is down, if this was 1974, but inflation's up, you, you can spend more. It's, it's not intuitive. And I think people just know it, it doesn't quite feel right. And there's a natural tendency to say, I think we should cut back. And maybe one other thought, uh, just to throw it out there, there's quite a bit of discussion out about endowment style investing or in the endowment portfolio. There's a famous uh, manager, David Swenson, who's at Yale. He's actually a local guy, I think from Wisconsin, but uh, wrote a book about endowment investment policy, which involved a lot of alternative assets and private equity. And and uh, that's not what we're talking about specifically here. That's That's his approach to how uh, those institutions invested. We're talking about, you know, you have the lump of assets. How how much can you spend out of those? No, you're you're spot on. And and, and I think the way to think about it, Scott, I, I great point. And and endowments invest differently and it, retirees all invest differently based mm-hmm. off of, of, of where they are, what they have, what their interests are, what what have you. The, the, the difference is you, you hear about the Harvard endowment, the Michigan endowment, the Texas endowment. You hear these endowments and all they do is go up and up and up and up. They are spending. They are mandated to spend every year. That is the difference, is that yeah. retirees retirees spend the same amount and simply hope that their money outlasts them, where endowments spend the same amount and the, 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 the overall AUM goes up into perpetuity. And that's just it's just a different way of thinking about pulling money out of the hat, flat out. You, you know, you, you mentioned not wanting to run out of money. I, I think most people, the number one concern is we don't want to run out of money in retirement. That, that sounds scary. It sounds horrible. Totally agree. We absolutely do not want to. I can happily say, you know, in 25 plus year career, have never had that happen. You know, so if you're regularly visiting, making smart decisions along the way, it, it doesn't happen that often, at least without being able to see it way, way off in the future. So, you know, running out of money is a primary concern. I think at number two, especially now, there's more of a heightened awareness of feeling pinched. You know, okay, I'm 65 now. At 85, what's my cost of living going to be? You you brought up the decade of the 70s, Andrew. You know, that's a that's a really you know interesting and scary one to look at because you know for most people, their cost of living doubled in that 10 year period. So how do you have this this pool of assets and maintain spending power? That's that's the second concern. But the third one that I think is important to bring up too is with the more simplistic lifestyle spending methodology or the 4% rule, I get concerned about people following that and really having a suboptimal retirement because too much money is left over. And we know there's a natural tendency to spend less as people age. There's often a very active period, say 15 years or so early in retirement, and then a significant slowdown. And if you look at the the research, the numbers behind it, I, I believe with using that simplistic 4% rule that gets so much press, it's something like two thirds of the time, the portfolio that's left at the end is twice what it was in the beginning. And with your method and some of the other ones that I really like, when you're taking into account the actual portfolio value each year, uh, it's not just that you're guarding against running out of money or losing ground to inflation, those number one and number two concerns, but that number three point, you're probably doing a better job of saying, hey, th- there's more money that could be spent. So take that trip, uh, take the grandkids to Disney, go on that cruise you've always wanted to do, um, You know, maybe spend some money and rent a, a, a cabin or the vacation place down on the beach in the winter and enjoy it while you can. So it's not... Um, all on the scarcity side and ending up with a, a, a large pool that essentially becomes legacy money. I think it's a great point, Scott. And, 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 you know, I, I think the, it's interesting. We, we, as a, as a, a collective group spend, we spend a lot of time focused on estate planning, on mm-hmm. taxes, on things that are important, are, are super, super important. No, no doubt about it. But if you look at kind of the quantifiable research and this, this Scott, the slide that I have here, to me, this is kind of the proof is in the pudding slide, if you will. Uh, that, that's a very technical term, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that I think this shows this shows you here. So let's let's look at at a at a five percent spending. If we do lifestyle spending again, this is a 1973 retiree million dollars, 60 40 portfolio. We run out of money uh, 21, 22 years into retirement. 
Uh, if we if we simply adjust the way that we take it out of the hat, to your point, we're not we're not adjusting how we spend. We're we're enjoying time throughout because we're spending our five percent, but we're taking into account the portfolio value. Our portfolio at the end of thirty years is worth two and a half million. We've also though Scott distributed, as you can see on the far right hand side, two point eight million dollars with that five percent endowment spending. So with the green, where the little green box is, we spent 2.2 million. We started with a million. We spent 2.2. To your point, we had some great weeks off the beach while it lasted. And, right. and then it didn't. And I, and I also think it's, it's really important because there, there's more and more, again, the estate planning, the tax planning, the leaving the legacy to, to things people are passionate about. You want to live your life the endowment spending policy or just thinking about things that way can allow you to do that. It can allow you to spend time with the grandkids, take them on trips, and then also have something to, to lead to something you're very passionate about. Um, and so, again, this takes your 4% lifestyle, 5% lifestyle, looks at the endowment spending, um, what was distributed on the right-hand side, and then what we spent throughout. And, again, I think it's kind of a proof is in the pudding uh, type slide that I like to reference. You know, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing, Andrew, talk about, okay, what's what's driving this? And, you know, we're not going to, we could talk about this for a long time, but actually structuring and building the portfolio. I don't know if you have it at hand. I think you, you, you might, this idea of the cash reserve ladder, because that really is a lot of the work that we do on this end. Say, okay, we have these assets. You hear terms like 60, 40. That's, that's a very general rough cut between how much in stocks, how much in bonds. But we really spend a lot of time going layers below that and saying, uh, as you talked about the pattern of market returns, okay, an 8% average return or a 10% average return sounds good, but it makes a tremendous difference when you're withdrawing funds, what that sequence of returns is. And if you have good years in the beginning, it, it, it can work out wonderfully and there's lots of excess money. If you have bad years in the beginning, though, you can run out quickly and we want to guard against those. It can be the same average return over that 30, 40 year retirement. But to protect against that, that risk of bad market episodes early on, the way we structure the portfolio uh, along the lines of what you have there to insulate ourselves is the way I like to think about it. Or like cars, so they have a crumple zone built in them for crashes. You know, we try and build a crumple zone in the portfolio with the short-term reserve being fed with dividends and interest income continually. So no matter what, if it's a terrible market year, if it's 2008, if it's 2020, we can keep sending those checks out and we're not selling things at a loss to allow ourselves to bridge over to that next high point. Looks like you have some slides here that, that kind of talk to that. Yeah, no, great, great segue, Scott. And I hadn't planned on referencing this slide because uh, we haven't discussed there. it, but I'm glad. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm glad you brought it up. It's it's one of my favorite slides, Scott. And, and the reason for it is in, in, in true transparency, I believe the biggest trick our industry plays on your clients and our clients is average annual return. Because mm -hmm. it's true. Everybody that retires is going to get roughly the same return in the S&P 500, roughly the same return in, in intermediate term or corporate you know, bonds or what have you. Sequence, though, really, really matters, especially in distribution. To your point about when you're accumulating, you really don't mind the bumpiness. In fact, if it's down a little bit and I'm buying more shares of a mutual fund or a stock or a bond, I like that. But this, this to your point, I think is extremely important. This shows 89 to 2,000. Average annual return is 8.43%. But you can see that first year you were up 32%. Things, things are great, kind of to my analogy of, of, of starting something in 06 versus 09. It's, it's a very different, different experience. This shows you then, you flip it around and go 2008 to 1989, your average annual return, 8.43%. It's, it's the same, but your experience is dramatically different based off of simply the sequence of these returns. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings, uh, I believe is, noted economist Paul Samuelson says, you can't eat average annualized returns. So you have two columns there, the same numbers, but in different sequences, the same average annualized return. But if you're trying to live off those, you're trying to eat, you know, pay, pay your, uh, for your housing, your food, shelter, your clothing, those essentials, 
um, the sequence makes all the difference in the world. So th this is the one I liked your, your visual here. It's something we often describe to people to try and explain, hey, it's not just that we're trying to pick winners in the market or exciting investment stories, but how do we structure this cash flow to allow for that growth, to stay ahead of inflation, to, to maintain your purchasing power, but to protect against that sequence um, risk that you just highlighted? Yeah, I think it's a great visual, Scott. I uh, I think there's a lot of things about this blue area in the middle, the, the cash flow reserve, to, to your point. I think it's important if you look at the green, when, when we buy, and my, my parents are the worst about this. They buy something and they want to check their statement the next day. And, and, and I say, mom and dad, look, we, we bought equities with a time horizon of five to seven years. Let, let, them, let them do their job. We'll check back in, fixed income, three to five years. And then the, the blue right there, Scott, to me, it is the anti-Kramer money. Turn off CNBC, yeah. go enjoy the grandkids, go play golf, not right now in, in Minnesota, but I've, I've been up there in the summer and it's, it's beautiful. So <laughs> go, go, play, go play golf when you can. But it's a, it's a way to your point, I call it reverse dollar cost ravaging. Mm -hmm. But when, you, when you're having to take money out, but, but your timing is not good and you're having to sell stocks, if, if, you, if you invested in 07, and made a good allocation stocks and bonds, but no had had no cash flow reserve. In 08 and 09, you were redeeming bonds for less than 100 cents on the dollar. You were re redeeming stocks for less than 100 cents on the dollar. So that that is very important, and I think it's critical to have that anti-Kramer money. I like to call it uh, in kind of that blue bucket to let the rest of your portfolio do its job. Anti-Kramer money. I love it. It, it. That's what I've often referred to as that uh, the crumple zone in the portfolio. So it's to, there to you go. Over. But uh, and I, I will mention you, you have some great slides here. Um, some people may just be listening. We're going to take the audio of this and, and share it. It may get posted as a podcast. Uh, we'll have this video up on my blog, which is just scottoath.com. And I have a couple deeper pieces where I put quite a bit together, both on 4% withdrawal rate and bucket strategy and um, some of these things that uh, some more material that will be um, up there as well. We, we talked about the decade of the 70s and really that perfect storm for retirees of that terrible 73, 74 market crash where I think at one point the S&P 500 was down 50% and you know cost of living doubling and of course ending the decade with double digit unemployment and double digit inflation and double digit interest rates. Uh, I posted some things recently, investment letters. I love market history and went back and found some old covers of Money Magazine from the mid 70s and posted them in the blog. And it's it's that gives you, I think, uh, a very interesting look at what was going on, what people's mindset were when you look at these covers of, of uh, Money Magazine and Forbes Magazine from that era. No, it does. I, 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 uh... I agree with that, Scott. Let me let me jump into the dividends real quickly. That's another part of this presentation. I know you and I discussed. It's yes. another area. Candidly, I'm I'm very passionate about, and honestly, I believe there there, there are probably more people in in our profession, including financial advisors, that don't completely understand dividends and the power of dividends. That I love the education around it. So let me let me hit that. I won't spend a ton of time on it, but I want to hit it because I think it's important. I also think. Going forward, there, there are periods of time where dividends are really, really important and, and where they contribute to total return and they improve your purchasing power over time. Scott, we've gone through a period where people have kind of forgotten about the value of dividends. Mm -hmm. uh, people want growth and they want pedal to the metal and what have you. The decade of the 2000s, if you didn't own dividend paying stocks, you actually had a significantly negative return. And, and a lot of people would tell you, this time period, I was in Santa Fe last week meeting with our portfolio managers, Brian McMahon, who runs our income builder. He said, there's no time in history this reminds me more of right now than 98 to 2002. Mm -hmm. He said, you basically have a lot of growth companies that are having their margins compressed. Their business is not going to be bad, but it's going to be tough to see really, really good earnings results out of some of these growth companies. He said, from 02 to 2010, nothing better to own than dividend paying stocks. And he said, I think right now. So, so let me jump into this just real quickly. I've got a couple of slides that I think do a good job of highlighting dividends. So yep, Scott, if, yeah, if, if, if you or some of your clients 
uh, over the past 30 years have focused on, I need something that yields X. I need a yielding security. You've gravitated towards bonds. Bonds have been yielding the most. So this is a chart showing the Barclays Aggregate Index, which is basically the equivalent of the S&P 500 when it comes to bonds. And in the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrat Index, the S&P 500 Dividend Aristocrat Index are comprised of companies in the S&P 500 that have increased their dividend for 25 consecutive years at a minimum. So right here, if you're buying for yield, you've bought the bonds. Let me show you the result of owning those two things. So in 1990, we bought the bonds because they yielded, as we just showed, they yielded north of 8%. That was super interesting to us. You got a little bit of a sugar high where your, your income was, was pretty good. Over time, equity income grows. So what this is showing, Scott, is $100,000 or uh, it's a million dollars uh, invested into either the dividend aristocrats or the Barclays aggregate bond index. We're taking the income. So we're not reinvesting anything. This is taking the income. This is almost something you wouldn't advise pre-retirement. You would say, let's reinvest, reinvest, reinvest. This is taking the income. You bought the bonds. You've taken income over time. Your ending income in that portfolio is $29,000. The, the, the value of the overall portfolio that started at a million, 1.2. So not, not terrible, but you're talking 30 years. Your purchasing power has been eroded considerably. If we buy the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats, our initial income was less as we looked at, but it grows over time. Equities grow their income over time. The income we're peeling off in 2021 off of what was a million dollars is $386,000. And our portfolio, our portfolio is worth $17.5 million. Amazing. Powerful, absolutely <laughs> powerful. And, 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 Again, when I think about purchasing power over time, that is, that is extremely valuable. You wouldn't want your entire 401k or your entire retirement portfolio in the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats. But I can tell you for my parents who are retired, their only equity exposure is dividends. It, it, it is power. They're going to need the income. One was a teacher. One was an insurance agent. They're going to need income, and they're both very healthy. So they're going to need income for years to come and dividends are a part of their equity portfolio. It, it, it's, it's so important. I think you're completely right. You know, the, the financial press, the financial media, it's very easy to overlook the dividends. What catches headlines is price appreciation. What did the Dow close at? What did the S&P 500 close at? Where were the FANG stocks? Were they hitting new highs? That's capital appreciation. I view that, especially in the accumulation phase, that is a very important component of your total return. But I mean, what is it, Andrew? If we look back over the last 100 years, it's about half of the S&P 500's return came from dividends. And this is something, you know, I'll caution people. I, I talk about, you know, looking at process. You've described an excellent process for thinking about retirement income versus product, especially on the insurance industry side of things. There's a lot of products that are being designed. Some of those are what are called uh, indexed, you, you know, they're, they're using derivatives to peg them to market returns, but you really have to look a layer down because what a lot of them do not do is they only offer credits for price appreciation, not dividends. And so I think, uh, you know, um, you definitely need to take a very close look here and you don't want to miss out on this power that you're demonstrating with dividend growth over time. So kind of to the point, you, you, you just said something that I'm going to get to on my next slide that I think is a great education piece for, for investors. I, I like to highlight this. This is another idea around the focus on yield versus income. So, so Scott, you and I, we, we can spend a dividend. We can't spend yield. So this is looking at the S&P 500. Since 1970, the yield on the S&P 500 was 3.41%. That was the yield. The current yield as of yesterday's close, 1.63%. So it's been cut in half. But look at what the dividend has done on that S&P 500. The dividend doubled from 1970 to 1980. It doubled again from 1980 to 1990. Then from 90 to 2010, it doubled again. And now it's up two and a half times from 2010 to the end of 2021. So focusing on yield alone, is not what you should be doing. 
the, 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 the dividend is the tangible part of this that we can spend. And I think that's, that's important to think about. Let me jump to this. I think this echoes what you just talked about, Scott. We as, as U.S. citizens, as U.S. investors, we love to be able to touch and feel and know what we're investing in. Uh, Shell is a whole lot more comfortable than Total. Yep. AT&T is a whole lot more comfortable than Orange in, in France. The reality is, and it's exactly why you just, what you just highlighted, Scott, the reality is the U.S. is the worst place in the world to look for dividend-paying companies. Why is that? So if you, if you look at this, what we're showing here, and it's kind of hard to see the map in there, but there is, there is a, a folded out globe, if you will. Mm -hmm. The average dividend yield, as I just stated, about 1.4% on U.S. companies. Around the world, much more attractive, even China that historically is not a dividend culture, or Japan, not a dividend culture, has considerably more dividend opportunities than the U.S. Why is that? The question always comes up, why is that? Scott, you hit the nail on the head. When CEOs are compensated, they're not compensated for their payout ratio or how much dividend they pay out to shareholders. They're paid, they're compensated on stock price appreciation, flat out. That's what they're focused on. The other part of that is taxation. There's double taxation on dividends here in the U.S. Companies are taxed, and then the investors are taxed. So it's just not a, a real advantageous thing to do. Now, should you look in the U.S.? Absolutely. Let me show you this next slide. I love this slide. So you should look in the U.S. We feel comfortable. When it comes to energy companies, utilities, real estate, there are some good dividend opportunities. But look around the rest of the world. Not only are, do we have the ability to geographically diversify, we can also diversify from a sector standpoint. God, if we owned all U.S. dividend payers coming into the financial crisis, and we owned the, 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 the Bank of Americas, the Chases, the city, we owned all financials, and we lost about 60% of our value if we owned the top dividend payers in the U.S. So, so why not look around the world and look at where the opportunities are. You can look at the, the telecom opportunities in the UK. You can see in Australia, you have interesting opportunities around materials, uh, f financials in China. It's just a way to diversify geographically and also diversify from a, from a sector standpoint. But this is something that I think is, is really not well known that I like to highlight, that I think people ought to be aware of. Yeah, that, that home country bias is, is very strong and it gets tighter and tighter the closer you go. I, I've met many people over the years. There's, uh, there are funds that specialize in Minnesota-based companies. And guess what? People in Minnesota love it because they know people who work there, their uncle worked for that company. And so we have to, we have to guard against that and explain that there's a, a very broad investment world. You know, one of the first things I remember learning way back when in early business school courses were double taxation of dividends. You know, that was a key thing you needed to know for accounting tests and finance tests. And it's not the same everywhere else. And you are absolutely right. You know, I've worked with many, many corporate executives. That's a specialty area for us. And looking at restricted stock and stock options and the incredible wealth building power that uh, some executives are lucky enough to participate in with or, or earn the right to participate in with with stock options that's based on share price and price appreciation not dividends but on the other side when you've built that wealth and preserve it and develop you know consistent spending power in down markets those dividends uh make a world of difference you you have a, do. a strategy, uh, the investment income builder. I know you, you've got some other slides there that really, I think, tell the story. Of course, past performance does not guarantee future results, right? We have that disclosure always, but uh, I think that's one of the ones that is really, you know, kind of hits the nail on the head in terms of telling the story. Yeah, so, so this is a perfect lead into that, Scott, then I'll quickly hit on the income builder for certain. So this basically shows a retiree in this type of vehicle, a growing dividend strategy. Uh, you retired with a million dollars in 1990. We're going to take 50000 out. We are going to use the lifestyle spending. So it's a 3% annual increase. You can see that the you, you, you go and the, the bar represents what you take out of the pie. The light blue is the dividend you receive off the S&P dividend aristocrats. The yellow is principal you have to redeem to meet that 5%. So you can see the first you know, five or six years, we do have to redeem a little bit. Eventually, you get into a, par, a, a time period where you have excess dividends that we're reinvesting off of that. We're not having to take those excess dividends to meet our 5% plus cost of living. 
So we invested a million dollars down at the bottom. You can see we've received dividends of, of about four and a half. Now, mind you, this is all over just 30 years. So this is not like 130 years we're looking at. This is 30 years of uh, retirement. We received dividends of 4.4 million. We spent 2.6. We reinvested 1.8. And our portfolio value is, is close to $20 million um, using, using this strategy. So we do, Scott. We have, we have the investment income builder, which, which takes all of this into account. Um, it is a, a world allocation, growing dividend strategy. Uh, we're currently sitting a little bit overweight international. Uh, we're doing that because the valuations are considerably more attractive outside of the U.S. Um, last year, in 2022, Income Builder was down 8%, percent disappointing on an absolute basis, no doubt about it. The world index was down about 18%. So, so on a relative basis, we, we hung in there. When I look at what led to that, there was a rotation from growth to value really over the course of the past two years. You saw a, a growth run from basically the financial crisis to the end of 2020. And we've seen that rotate a little bit, which is in favor of something like the income builder. So our overweight to energy, to financials, to utilities really helped us in, in a year like last year. Around some specific stocks, Scott, that, that, that helped the portfolio, I mentioned earlier, Orange. Orange is a French telecom company that's a global, a global type entity. China Mobile, Merck, Pfizer, AstraZeneca. Um, we really, really like global companies right now, specifically that are domiciled outside of the U.S. And so obviously a Merck and Pfizer and AstraZeneca, they're, they're doing a lot of their business here in the U.S. They're, they're, some, of the, some of them are just domiciled other places where we can, where we can take advantage of, of that. Mm -hmm. And maybe I realize maybe we should should back up here at the end and offer a definition. I mean, what is a dividend, Andrew? It's you own equity in a company. You're you're a fractional owner of a company. The company has excess earnings. Uh, some companies that we call growth companies might take that and build a new plant or hire more people or put more into advertising or research and development. But dividend paying companies or value oriented companies, t tell us the story. It, it, that's great. And you talk about something that I'm, I'm passionate about as well. So, so dividend paying companies, uh, they, they, they pay out a percentage of their earnings in the form of dividends. And, and that is what they call a payout ratio. Mm -hmm. Now, intuitively, Scott, you would think, well, I don't want a company that has a higher payout ratio because I want them putting money back into their company for growth and development. And in theory, that's correct. But you know what they do, Scott, if they're doing that, you kind of have to trust that that company really knows what they're doing. Think about it this way. If you have 10 different projects and you've paid out 50% of your earnings in the form of revenue, you're going to put basically 50 cents at five of those 10 projects. You're not going to bet on each one of those projects. So what do you do? As opposed to just throwing them against the wall and seeing what sticks, you're going to go project by project by project and figure out, okay, I've got 50 cents. I'm going to put 10 cents to five of these. Which five am I going to do? You're going to be more prudent with how you spend your capital. So in theory, for my kids, I mentioned 529s earlier. My kids own, and we don't have a 529 at Thornburg, so it's a different company. They own dividend paying stocks. The high correlation between payout ratio and earnings per share growth over time is highly consistent because they're prudent with how they spend their capital. So yes, it is a percentage of the earnings that they give back to the shareholder in the form of a dividend. Well, this is this has been great. You know, I think the dividend strategy, we view that as, uh, I, I view that personally, especially in uh, retirement portfolios, more so, you know, very valuable component, something to consider. Really appreciate the uh, the overview and the tour of the endowment spending policy. I think there are some strategies I, stay away from or less fond of that i think is a is a very good one we like it and think about things in that methodology especially that cash flow reserve ladder uh, we also typically layer on monte carlo analysis which is another kind of deeper mathematical way of randomizing those returns and looking at that sequence of returns and trying to stress test um i see we are you know at the top of the hour i think um I don't know if you have maybe just a couple more minutes, Andrew, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to throw them out there and we can hang on for maybe a, 
a minute or two. I'll see if any uh, questions come through in the in the chat here. Absolutely. I, I, I just maybe as an aside, uh, just a moment ago as we we're speaking, you talked about you mentioned yeah I, home bases here in Minnesota, and out my front window, four deer just ran right in front as you were talking a minute ago, wow. going through <laughs> the knee deep snow. So kind of a classic. Uh, Minnesota scene. Well, I'm not seeing any questions. And uh, I think this was great, very informative, gave us a lot to think about. Appreciate you sharing and your time. Thank you, Andrew. And oh, uh, well, maybe here is one. Let's see here. How do you evaluate stock redemptions versus dividends? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a good question. Um, maybe buybacks? Potentially is 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 I, I kind of maybe it's, yeah buybacks are in the news a lot these days. So it's uh, yeah. So, so so it 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 is something I think there we we place weight on both of them. Um, you know the 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 buybacks can be for 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 a couple of different reasons. I I think the biggest thing we factor Scott versus those because you could talk to our portfolio management team up and down and they would tell you pluses and minuses on on the way they judge both of those. What I will tell you specifically on the dividends, is if the company is increasing or, or, or decreasing their dividend, one of the things we focus on are companies that are growing their dividends consistently over time. And, and that, they're, they're, I think when you think about dividend paying companies, we think about the ability to do it, but then also the willingness. Mm -hmm. You find a lot of companies that have one or the other, and sometimes you see a lot of willingness where they're going to pay a six, seven, eight, nine percent dividend, but gosh, they don't have the ability to sustain that. Mm -hmm. Or they have the ability but maybe the CEO's compensation isn't tied to that. So there's not really the willingness. So right. I would think about those two things. When we evaluate companies, it's the ability and the willingness to buy, to buy dividend, to, to pay dividends and to buy dividend paying stocks over time. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And we will have this recording available. Uh, the white papers Andrew mentioned, we'll have those available and have a number of other related articles, uh, like I mentioned on my blog, scottoath.com, or just email us at the office. Happy to set up a time to talk through how any of this may, uh, you know, may apply to each of you individually. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott.